buildups, how they're made, and how they're used. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. If this photo brings back memories of what you might have done as a kid on a Saturday morning, and if you remember looking into a store window like this and seeing models that look like this, you're going to enjoy this program because we're going to talk about Ravel model buildups. Growing up on Long Island in the 1950s, the first address in California I ever knew was 4223 Glencoe Avenue in Venice. Just the sound of it was really cool. In 1961, I bought the Ravel SAS Caravel kit. And you notice in the background there, of this uh, Lenwood cover, you see the Swiss Air airplane and Ravel offered an option for 10 cents. You could right away uh, and send for uh, Swiss Air decals for your uh, Caravel kit, which is exactly what I did. And then I uh, built it. This is a build up in my first attempt at uh, model photography on the tar paper uh, patio of my uh, New York apartment, Long Island apartment. And uh, so here you've got the Caravel model with a Corgi uh, armored uh, troop carrier. And uh, it's not going to win an Aviation Week uh, photo contest, but it was the beginning. I uh, enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1967, was assigned to uh, a base in Japan for two years, discovered the base hobby shop uh, with the then brand new Hasegawa 172nd scale kit series uh, for 65 cents a piece. I think I built every single one of them. And then I'd uh, take a piece of cardboard, go out in a field on base, uh, and then take a photo of the model. And boy, you could just about hear that hard AB light uh, as the 105 goes roaring down the runway and, uh, you know, rattling every window on base. But uh, this was fun. And I'm still doing it to this day. Now I'm doing it for my YouTube channel and other uses, and uh, the camera's a little better. But it all started with those uh, magical hobby shop window displays. And here you see a cardboard... Uh, uh, display for the Ravel uh, Allison 501 turboprop engine uh, with all major parts that move and uh, build it, run it, see it work. Only 598, uh, which is interesting because uh, that's the motorized kit. The uh, non-motorized kit was 498, but still that's a chunk of change for um, <clears throat> us kids back in, in that era. Uh, we'll save those uh, cardboard uh, displays for another program. What I'm going to discuss today are the single buildups like the P6MC Master you see there at the bottom of the window or the USS Essex uh, that you can see underneath uh, uh, the kid's uh, left knee there. So we say buildup and store display. What's this all about? Well, in 1955, uh, Ravel issued the American Airlines DC-7 flagship, which was uh, the first true uh, detailed scale plastic model of an airliner. And this is an original 1955 Ravel factory buildup. Uh, it survived 65 years, and it looks like the day it was made. This was from uh, TNA Hobbies in Burbank, California. TNA stood for Tony and Addie, and that was the Nacarado family. And Tony Nacarado uh, was uh, kind enough to uh, bestow this model uh, to me. Uh, sadly, he passed away last year, but. Uh, one of the luminaries of uh, modeldom here in uh, Southern California, a great RC modeler and a champion of the hobby. But what's interesting is I asked Tony about this. I said, sorry, right, how did the store get a buildup? And his answer was that these were uh, dealer incentive models. When a hobby shop ordered a gross of a particular kit, 144 models, they would get as an award a buildup from Ravel. And these would go in the windows to entice us young modelers to see it and buy it. And it was a marketing tool. But uh, uh, Tony's dad, who uh, owned the store at that time, started in 1954, built uh, hermetically sealed display cases to protect these models from the elements of uh, smog, which was pretty heavy back in those days in LA. And uh, lo and behold, this is a survivor in uh, pristine condition, one of the real treasures of my, of my collection today. So I asked Tony the inevitable question. I said, so how long would it take a hobby shop to sell 144 models? And the answer was, it depends where the hobby shop was located. In this case, TNA Hobbies in Burbank was one mile south of Burbank Airport, and it catered to the Lockheed uh, Corporation up there. And so when the uh, Ravel F-104 Starfighter was issued, um, it, uh, the 144 kits arrived at the store, 
and they sold all of them in two weeks. So you can imagine a hobby shop in New York with a Grumman or Republic airplane, uh, Seattle, Washington for Boeing, any of the places where an air or around Air Force bases or commercial airports, uh, the kit sales were, were pretty strong. And Ravel used actual buildups in their 1958 catalog. In 1957, they were using the uh, box art, but in 58, they went to the buildup and you could actually see the finished model. And I think that was even more of an enticement because uh, you wanted to go out and, and buy them and make them look just like the ones in the catalog. So let's take a look at one of these. Let's look at the Eastern Connie. Uh, if you look at the box art by uh, Dick Kashadi, you notice that on the cheat line, there are the window stripe, as they call it. The uh, Falcons are gold. This symbolized the Eastern Golden Falcon All First Class Service, uh, which debuted in 1955. And on the Eastern, what they call the meatball on the forward fuselage, the Falcons were gold. And yet on the model, uh, they're red. And the reason is uh, an example of uh, how sometimes the covers don't match the <laughs> decals in the box. But the reasoning was economics. In other words, to add a third color, especially if it was metallic gold, which was costly, and try and register that at a very small size, 3 sixteenths of an inch, uh, and have it in four little spots on a decal sheet, two on each side, uh, wasn't really as practical. Now, I have to give Ravel a pass in this case because Eastern Connies did fly with Red Falcons if they were day coach or uh, regular service. So uh, I can understand how that decision was made. Uh, regardless, it's still a, a beautiful model and a beautiful buildup. In the Jet Age, you had the Jet Horizon series, which is the reissue of uh, some of the earlier late 50s kits. And this is the American Astrojet, the fan jet version of the 707. This was a beautiful model. I mean, it was uh, derived from the original 707 with the earlier engines, and that itself was derived from the KC-135 kit, as was the real airplane. But uh, you had a lot of good wing detail, control services. It was just all the panel lines. Uh, it really looked like the airplane. It was a very, very nice buildup. And that airplane emanated from this machine, the Boeing B-47. The B-47 uh, was considered by uh, Boeing test pilot Tex Johnston uh, to be one of the most significant airplanes ever built. Why? Because it was the first to have the 35 degree swept wing, uh, the first large airplane to have the 35 degree swept wing, potted engines, the General Electric J-47s, and the large structure and a sleek uh, aerodynamic uh, fuselage, and a 600 mile an hour jet bomber in 1948 was pretty hot stuff. So in this uh, photo montage by uh, modeler Craig Cadera, we see the Ravel Pre-S B-47 kit. Now, if you've heard these terms before, S kits and Pre-S kits, uh, what that means, S stood for styrene, and it was a marketing hook for Ravel. You see it there on the tube of glue. The S kits were the pinnacle of Ravel models in the mid to late 1950s, and the Pre-S kits were the earlier versions of some of these uh, issued in 53, 4, and 5. And so Ravel's uh, set of bombers uh, the uh, B-29, the B-36, the B-47, and the B-52 were all pre-S kits with, without landing gear. Uh, they came on the revolving stand, and they were uh, very simple and easy to build and quite elegant and quite beautiful. But uh, from the Ravel archives, this model was discovered, and it's the pre-S B-47 with landing gear, and it's a mystery. Uh, you know, it's not, I, I, at first, when I first saw this, I, I thought it was a mod of Somebody added gear to it, but if you look at the model, it was molded that way. The wheel wells, uh, the zinc chromate uh, landing gear wells and doors. The, the outriggers on this particular model had snapped off uh, on the uh, inboard engines there. But you see the main gear and also the mounting ball had snapped off somehow uh, ahead of the uh, rear main gear. But uh, this was indeed molded this way. And I'm wondering if this was a, a prototype of some sort, a one of a kind, I really don't know. And if you have an answer to that question, please uh, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. I wanna discuss the fact that uh, today we talk about vintage models, those old models from the 50s. You open the box and 1950s air comes wafting out and they're old models of old planes. Well, guess what guys? In, 1950s, in the 1950s, Ravel was issuing models of what were then brand new aircraft, ocean liners, cars, you name it, these were brand new, or they were uh, ships and armor from World War II, which our dads had uh, fought just only uh, 10, 10 years earlier. So uh, take a look at that F-89 Scorpion in the lower left. And uh, here's the real airplane, uh, missile-equipped, all-weather, two-seat uh, jet interceptor, 
uh, pretty cool for early 50s. And so, of course, you had to have a model of your F-89 Scorpion. And so here's the Revell kit. Uh, and, well, of course, the box art, God bless it, you know, it, it, taking off in full burner, which the airplane didn't have, uh, in the snow with the front tires skidding and the canopy open in the Arctic. Okay. But regardless, it was a beautiful kit. Let's take a look at the buildup. There we go. And uh, you see the red uh, markings for, uh, for Arctic survival. And uh, it was simple, but uh, really looked like the airplane in that era. Uh, it's not going to win any IPMS model contest today, but this is the state of the art back in, in 1955. And speaking of interceptors, it doesn't get any better than this. The Convair F-106, the world's fastest single-engine uh, jet-powered airplane at Mach uh, 2.41 on a record run in 1959. So you had to have a Revell model, and there it is in the test, uh, flight test markings, uh, taking off from the lake bed at Edwards. And uh, this had to be one of the most beautiful Revell models ever done. It had what they call flush rivet detail, so you didn't have those bowling ball size rivets all over the place. And uh, it was scaled from official blueprints from Convair. And wow, it, it looked like you had the real airplane scaled down on your dresser in your, in your room. Uh, just a fabulous kit. Uh, here you see a rear view showing the uh, operating uh, flight controls, the elevons and uh, rudder. And of course, my favorite part of this whole model, the zinc chromate uh, line speed brakes, which are shown in the open position. And you notice the red for the flight test scheme. And I have to mention that uh, my dear friend and partner in crime, Hank Caruso, fellow aviation artist and honorary naval aviator, I might add, um, came up with a theory of why uh, flight test airplanes are painted red. And he called it chroma kinetic augmentation that the frequency on the color spectrum uh, affects the boundary layer and makes the airplanes go fast. And if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. How many of you built this kit? This is the reissue of the uh, original P2V7 Neptune, uh, which was issued in silver as the Navy uh, patrol bomber. And this is the Operation Deep Freeze uh, version, uh, the Arctic exploration in uh, the late 1950s. Um, and here's a, this is not a factory buildup, but this is an out of the box original kit build up with uh, some weathering and some really nice detail, all hand painted, and uh, a nice example of what you could do uh, with a little advanced modeling skills in, uh, in this time period. Of course, you have the WV-2 Warning Star, as it was called, the Radar Connie, uh, just ripping your face off, coming out of the, you know, just exploding out of the box stop at you, and uh, pretty dramatic, and of course, you had to have this kit. Uh, and so, here's the real airplane, originally in bare metal, and it was later uh, painted in the dark gray, and uh, other variations, but uh, uh, quite an elegant looking airplane. And here is the buildup. And the props are turning with a little Photoshop magic. But I wanted to point out that the model was molded in this color. So to build it, you literally painted the uh, flat or semi-gloss black uh, radome and the leading edge uh, de-icer boots and the props and threw the decals on there and you had a finished model. It was just stunning, beautiful, beautiful kit. Let's try another one. This is the Convair Tradewind. Uh, turboprop uh, troop transport and seaplane. And uh, let's see how that translates into the buildup. Look at that. So here's our Revell buildup flying over the, uh, over the uh, overcast. And uh, again, molded in this dark sea blue. Just a beautiful, beautiful kit. Well, the missiles uh, played a big part. You know, oddly uh, enough, the Revell missiles did not sell all that well for whatever reason. I don't know, maybe because they didn't have guys sitting in them when they weren't, uh, you know, winged jets or whatever. But uh, the Revell missiles were not big sellers back in the day. Now they're coveted uh, collectible kits, if you can find them. And this is the Nike Hercules. It's a Douglas design. 25,000 were built. And this was part of the Civil Defense uh, Cold War uh, defense network of uh, ground-to-air um, or surface-to-air anti-aircraft missiles that were to protect uh, American factories and, and uh, defense sites all around the country. This is a test firing actual photo. Uh, and you see the ocean out there. So I'm assuming this is some sort of secret remote missile base. Well, guess what? This is Lido Beach, Long Island, located about halfway between Jones Beach and Long Beach on the south shore of Long Island. And on the other side of that berm is a resort beach. And on the near side, you've got underground 12 nuclear-tipped uh, Nike Hercules missiles. Uh, these bases all over Long Island were to protect Republic and Grumman and Sperry uh, from uh, possible uh, nuclear attack. But, uh, you know, these, these bases were located in neighborhoods and next to schools and uh, who knew, you know, there are hundreds of them around the country and nobody had a clue that uh, any of them were, were based uh, so close to where they might have lived. So here's the Revell kit, really one of the best 
of the missiles that they did. Uh, the Nike Hercules sold in those days, I think, for a buck forty-nine. And uh, I, uh, this is my buildup, and I did it to replicate the window displays there. You'd always see the action figures uh, and the missile, which actually moved up and down on the launcher. Uh, here's another view, and the hydraulic arms actually operated, and it was just a stunning piece of engineering for, uh, for a plastic model. And uh, look at the detail there. You got the figures <clears throat> and the uh, lieutenant up on the top there giving orders to the guys, and uh, they're getting ready to fire that thing. But uh, just a, a beautiful model, a little bit complicated, but uh, if you took your time and you were patient, it went together very, very well and uh, represented a, a nice buildup. I'd like to close with a couple of uh, oddities. Uh, here's a buildup of the uh, Lockheed P3 Orion. And this model from Ravel was created from the electric commercial airliner. Uh, Ravel, without realizing it, made the world's first limited edition model kit. They destroyed the molds of the uh, Electra airliner uh, to make the P3. In other words, they could never strike another uh, set of uh, kits from the uh, Electra airliner molds once those changes were made. And so that gave the uh, airliner a, a huge collectible value. I believe it was the first kit to punch through $100 on a vintage collectible market. At the peak of the market, these things were in mint shape. You'd find one maybe for $200, $250. Uh, it was kind of insane, but it was super rare. There was only one pressing, uh, as far as I knew. And here in the box art of the airliner, you got it uh, racing down the runway at Burbank in the rain. And the P3 uh, was built uh, for a friend, and it was done in the later markings. The kit was issued in the white top and gray, dark gray bottom. But uh, uh, a beautiful kit, but totally different from the airliner. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not something that could be converted back. So I wanted to mention that's why. Uh, the American Electra has the, the value that it does on the collectible circuit. And you remember we talked about the Eastern Connie, and let's compare this to a competing kit from Monogram. As good as the uh, Ravel Connie was, and it was quite a stunning uh, model, uh, take a look at the Monogram TWA constellation with the tip tanks, uh, the boarding stairs, the stewardesses, the ground tug. Uh, the model was molded in white and silver. This is an out of the box build by Craig Cadera, and uh, each kit was 98 cents. So in terms of value, you could see the difference, but uh, it was kind of, I guess, like a Chevy Ford type of uh, rivalry between Monogram and Ravel, some like the one or the other. Uh, the bottom line, they were both uh, quite, quite stunning uh, to build and to look at. And here we have that American 707. Compare this to the die-cast kits of today. If you're into die-cast, uh, and forgive me for mentioning that on a plastic uh, model, uh, episode, but uh, this is a one two hundred scale. It's about half the size of the Ravel kit. And the detail on this, you'd need a magnifying glass to see all the little placards and, uh, you know, just the incredible amount of detail on this model. Uh, this is the 707-320, the larger uh, intercontinental uh, version, but uh, uh, just an interesting comparison from uh, the old days to what uh, what's available today. Uh, and a beautiful mint kit and a die cast are uh, probably about the same price, probably around 100 bucks. And finally, a tip for you guys, there's no better way to a girl's heart than with a Ravel buildup. Special thanks to the uh, my usual uh, partners in crime here. These are the folks who contributed uh, many of the beautiful buildups that you saw in this uh, episode. And if you like uh, our channel, uh, feel free to subscribe hit that 707 at lower right. We'd love to have you on board. We'll be doing more uh, modeling uh, videos and all sorts of other aviation videos as we celebrate aviation. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next time.